to close the camera for improve the connection. No. Yeah, now it's recording. Well, it's a great help. Podemos começar? It's a great pleasure to, to be the chairman of uh, Jeff Shah uh, talk. I, I, I know Jeff about 40 years ago when I was in Northwestern. He was taking his doctor degree, working on the pen levy uh, conjecture when he solved the, the problem by uh, proving the existence of oscillatory motion in finite time for the five body problem. Uh, Later on, I, I met him in in, uh, in, in Guanajuato, the first ham season in Guanajuato. Uh, and then I invited him to come to Recife for a month. He accepted. Uh, by that time, I also invited the uh, Don Sari and uh, Dita Schmidt. These were the three that began the the program, the visit, the the program of visitors to the math department, which I had until 2015. And, and, and then uh, after uh, he, ca he, he came uh, then for a month, when he gave an excellent course on nine load diffusion in, in the department. And a few years later, three, about three years later, I went to Georgia Tech to work with him during a quarter. And so his uh, presence in the uh, in the group of Celeste McKenzie Recife is very uh, uh, important. He, he was one of the uh, supporters of this uh, the development of development of this group, uh, for for which we uh, thank him very much. So uh, I pass now to the word to him because he's he's going to talk about Poincaré Last Geometric Theorem. Please, Jeff. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roberto. And uh, indeed, it was uh, a great pleasure uh, meeting uh, Roberto. Uh, so I, that that goes really, really far back uh, when I was a graduate student at Northwestern, and uh, Roberto came to visit uh, Northwestern for for a year. And in fact, uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, searching for a job, uh, uh, Roberto. Uh, wrote a letter of recommendation uh, for me. And uh, this probably one of the reasons why I got uh, so many offers uh, in my first uh, job search. And uh, uh, then a few years later, I went to uh, Recife and to, uh, well, happy to be the first in the visitors uh, program, uh, Hedda Belto's uh, 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 program there a semester mechanics uh, group. And uh, as uh, Hedberto said, uh, he uh, came to uh, visit me, I uh, spent a quarter at uh, uh, Georgia Tech. And interestingly, if you see the um, announcement of this seminar announcement, the picture that uh, they shown, somehow they found a picture, uh, they shown was what I took at that time, uh, 30 years ago. So now I'm much older, but if uh, you look at uh, the belt hole, he is, he looks almost the same as uh, uh, 30 years ago. He does not, uh, uh, he, he aged well. Okay, uh, so uh, it, it's a really a pleasure to, uh, to give a talk here. And I really like this uh, seminar series and it goes, it has, uh, uh, well, a lot of mathematics and a lot of astronomy and uh, a lot of things that uh, uh, that fit my uh, interest, uh, my interest really well. In fact, when I try to decide what talk I should give, whether I should give uh, something on astronomy or uh, 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 solar uh, dynamics or giving something in pure uh, mathematics. And uh, so, yeah, in the end, I decided to uh, to give something which, uh, again, is very uh, classical, okay? And uh, it's a Pancrase last geometric theory. We uh, did uh, uh, something we uh, recent, uh, recently done with uh, 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 some of my uh, uh, colleagues. Okay, so uh, they, 
what I'm going to talk about is really, uh, really uh, the uh, very classical. Okay, so it's uh, it's a twist map theorem. Okay, and uh, or you can call it a Pankray's last geometric theorem, or you can call a Pankray a Birkhoff theorem. Okay, the theorem is really simple and elegant, and Pankray actually uh, derived uh, this uh, uh, theorem in the context of uh, restricted three-body problem. So one can abstract uh, uh, the uh, restricted three-body problem uh, to a, a problem looking at uh, uh, twist maps. So uh, we start with uh, this standard uh, twist map. So you have an annulus. So in, in this case, my annulus will be uh, a circle uh, a circle cross a, a line interval. So this is uh, the annulus, and uh, we assuming we are take looking at uh, first properties area preserving and second properties orientation preserving. So I always assume that uh, the diffeomorphism, homeomorphism that uh, I'm looking at is uh, uh, orientation preserving. So I'm not going to uh, repeat this. So it will be orientation preserving. And also that uh, since we're talking about Hamiltonian uh, systems or conservative systems, so assuming it's area preserving. So I have a homeomorphism of the annulus and uh, it's orientation preserving, area preserving, and uh, uh, it preserves the, uh, the boundaries, okay? So we say this is a twist map. Oh, there's a typo there. Uh, we say this is a twist map if, okay, it, uh, Tests kind of uh, the two boundaries in opposite directions. So moves points here to there and moves points on the inner boundary to this. But since circle, you don't have a definitive order which direction you're moving. You can think this way or you can think that way. Both is the same. So that uh, the better uh, to look at it, it's, uh, it's better to look at uh, the, uh, the covering space. Okay, the covering space, of course, the, a, a strip, okay? And strip uh, going from uh, zero to one, and it moves this boundary in that direction and moves that boundary in this direction. And we all know this famous theorem. That's called a Pancray's last theorem. And it was uh, Pancray uh, did not prove it uh, before he died. He died uh, before he was uh, 60. And uh, uh, Birkhoff uh, proved the theorem. And the theorem says that uh, every preserving uh, twist map has at least uh, two uh, distinct uh, fixed uh, points. Okay. And uh, so this theorem is elegant, it's simple. And if you look at today's mathematics, a lot of it is. Uh, you can think uh, are motivated uh, by this simple theorem. If you think about the symplectic geometry and uh, the other conjecture and various other things actually all came from this uh, simple theorem. Even today, the cyber Witten uh, theory and a lot of other theories with, uh, with uh, four dimensional uh, uh, symplectic manifolds and or you can say come from this theorem as a lot of uh, uh, development in uh, this area. Okay, so, uh, well, interestingly, that uh, uh, this theorem uh, basically implies not only just two fixed points, actually implies there are infinitely many uh, periodic points. So if you have a twist map and uh, a map of annulus as the rotation number of these two sides, there you have infinitely periodic points. That's as a corollary of uh, uh, this. Uh, okay. And interestingly, also, this is the first uh, serious result in mathematics in this side of the uh, Atlantic. Okay. So basically, that uh, uh, the mathematics in the US was not very. Uh, uh, well, not very important at the time. And uh, uh, the Birkhoff uh, proved, you can say, 
first two theories in this side of Atlantic. And one is the Pankhue Markov theory, and the second is of the Gothic theory. So these are the theories number one, theories number two in US. Okay. And uh, interestingly, I'm going to use both of them. And a really, really important theory. I'm going to uh, use uh, uh, implicitly or explicitly uh, work of ergodic theory uh, in this talk. And uh, it's so such a, a fundamental theory in mathematics. Okay. All right. So let me, before I state my uh, theory or the generalization of the uh, uh, Pankhue's uh, last uh, geometric theorem, and uh, I, I'll give some basic settings of uh, what uh, in the context what I'm going to talk about. And uh, well, uh, simply put it, I, I'm trying to uh, uh, prove a theorem which uh, replaces okay the twist condition with some other conditions, which typically are easy to obtain. And uh, from these conditions, one can uh, get uh, infinitely many uh, periodic points on uh, anonymous. But because in the uh, statement uh, uh, or the results I'm going to present, I constantly interchange the underlying space okay, uh, of my system. So there are th uh, three types. You can get more if you get to the surfaces or you can extend to uh, high dimensions and then that's a different problem. But in uh, surfaces, there are three different uh, spaces I I'm going to consider. One is uh, two dimensional sphere. One is animus I just talked about. And one is uh, the disk, okay? And the three different spaces actually are very much related and I treat them as the same. The reason for that is on S2, if you have a two sphere, okay? So suppose I have a, uh, a two sphere. Okay, if, well, two sphere, every perceived map or any map uh, homeomorphism, you should have at least two fixed points by uh, Lefschetz fixed point theory. Okay, so if I, I look at one fixed point, I can blow up that to one fixed point. If I blow up this one fixed point, what I get is going to be a disk topologically. Okay, so therefore a sphere and a disk, the difference just uh, uh, blowing up one point. And on disk, again, by uh, drawer, uh, this time you can, you can use drawer fixed point, there must be another fixed point inside. If you blow up that one, then you get a animus. So these are the three spaces that uh, I'm going to uh, state uh, interchangeably, state my uh, result, and depend on what uh, uh, kind of a context I, I need. Okay, so I, I'm not going to uh, not just uh, focus on uh, animus. Okay. And uh, uh, also that uh, on animus, that in uh, all spaces that uh, I, it's every perceived map. So I have a form here and I have area form here. I have an area, you can define area, but there's one particular place that uh, I want to find the primitive of the area. So area form is this. And the primitive is, well, a differential one form and whose derivative is equal to the area form. And so for on animus, the primitive, there are many different choices. Over here and there, uh, uh, well, the, let me just say here, uh, there's no, uh, just one choice because it, there's a topology is trivial, but here there are quite a few choices. So throughout the talk, I'm going to fix the primitive to be this uh, differential one form, okay? Just basically that uh, derivative of this would define the area form. There are other choices because it depends on the first homology 
of this uh, animus, which is non-trivial. But anyway, just uh, uh, fix the notation here for uh, the animus. Okay, for this one, that it's unique. You don't have to. You don't have uh, different choices. All right, so that's a setting. And before I state my result, I also need to uh, to just define some uh, uh, general stuff, uh, general abstract nonsense, basically. And uh, uh, so, well, first uh, first of all, is uh, given a symplectic manifold. And we say the symplectic manifold is exact symplectic if the form is exact. Uh, that is, a beta omega has a primitive. So that's why I need to define primitive. I need the primitive design uh, to define some other stuff. Okay. So we say the symplectic diffeomorphism is exact symplectic if, well, uh, the, the manifold is exact symplectic and the the map that this one is a exact form, okay? So exact symplectic just uh, uh, basically uh, means uh, this is exact. Well, this has to be closed because the derivative of this has to be equal to zero because it's a symplectic uh, diffeomorphism. And so exact symplectic is a class of symplectic diffeomorphism, uh, which uh, makes this exact, okay? so. Well, if you don't like this definition, there's another equivalent definition. That is a synthetic diffeomorphism is Hamiltonian. If F, the diffeomorphism is a time one map of a Hamiltonian flow with a time periodic Hamiltonian function. So uh, this Hamiltonian diffeomorphism is a special class of a synthetic diffeomorphism and uh, it's, uh, well, the basically, uh, well, it's by as name suggests, uh, it's just uh, uh, different morphism uh, coming from a Hamiltonian system. So uh, this definition uh, certainly uh, is easier to understand, and uh, but it's uh, 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 better than exact synthetic different morphism, and uh, uh, because it can be defined on manifolds which is not exact. Okay. And uh, particularly complex symplectic manifold can be exact. Of course, cotangent bundle is always exact, and but compact symplectic manifold cannot be exact because there's no such uh, primitive. Okay, but you can always define Hamiltonian uh, diffeomorphism in, uh, in practical purpose, and almost all the cases, uh, the exact symplectic diffeomorphism, the properties are the same as Hamiltonian. Uh, diffeomorphism. So this is just uh, some uh, very, uh, very general uh, remark, okay, about, uh, uh, all right. So now we can define some symplectic invariants, okay. And uh, so recent uh, symplectic geometry uh, has uh, discovered a lot of nice properties for some of the symplectic invariants, and uh, the invariants are sometimes local, sometimes global, and they have uh, uh, really, really uh, significant implications uh, on dynamics. But most symplectic geometers, their focus is on geometry, not dynamics. But here I'm going to look at uh, the dynamical properties uh, coming from these uh, invariants. Okay, and uh, for the first uh, uh, quantity I want to define is action function. So if you are doing Hamiltonian dynamics, okay, you are familiar with action. And if you do uh, uh, Lagrangian dynamics, it's even more so. Basically, it's just the Hamilton's action functional, okay? But uh, in a uh, Hamiltonian uh, context, okay, in Hamiltonian context, uh, it's because not every Hamiltonian can be written in uh, Lagrangian mechanics, but uh, Lagrangian mechanics, of course, you can convert to uh, Hamiltonian uh, uh, mechanics. Okay, so if you have a sim exact symplectic diffeomorphism, uh, you can define action function, okay, by looking at uh, the primitive of this, because for exact symplectic diffeomorphism, this is exact, therefore, it's equal to a derivative of some function. Okay, we call that function, action function. 
Okay, and uh, uh, so the action function, if you in Lagrangian mechanics, that's just simple have, have the act, usual action function. Okay, if you think in terms of uh, Hamiltonian, these are usually the generating functions in disguise. Okay, they're just action functions. Okay, and uh, here, this is a, a primitive. So therefore the definition is up to a constant. So you can always just compare the action. Uh, the absolute value of action, of course, uh, depend on the integral constant. Another thing, which is interesting, which associate topology of the, your uh, space to the dynamics, and which is interesting and a very good connection between topology and uh, the dynamics, is here the, the choices of beta. That we, last time I said for analysis, I choose a certain beta, but beta choice is up to a, uh, the first homology. Uh, I'm sorry, first cohomology of the manifold. So different choices of beta give you just different measurement of the action, and which itself is very interesting. So I'm not going to uh, uh, to get into uh, that. Okay. So this is action, and if you have periodic points, you can define the action for periodic points, the average action. Okay. Uh, easily, just the average of the actions on these points. Okay, and if you have a extend this concept, if you have any invariant measure, okay, suppose, uh, well, periodic points is a simple uh, atomic measure. And if you look at uh, the area, it's area preserving. So area itself is invariant measure. So we, one can define uh, the action of the invariant measure by this, okay, just integrate of your action function and that gives you the action of the event measure, okay? And it does depend on the choice of beta, okay? So if I fix a beta, and uh, then, it, it, then it's fixed, okay? And uh, uh, so this, again, it's uh, the action of the event measure. And the periodic points, of course, it's a special uh, event measure. And you can just set several points, you average over these several points. And if uh, other event measure, and uh, you you just do the integral. The special case, easy to compute, is periodic points. You can do just add up the numbers. Or uh, if you have uh, 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 the area, you just integrate over the whole uh, space. And this number, what you get is called the mean action. Okay, uh, in literature, this is called, uh, in some symplectic geometry literature, this is called Calabi invariant. Okay, uh, just to give uh, the mean action, uh, just to give a fancy name, it's called a Calabi invariant. All right, so these are general things. So now we can, uh, I can state a theorem. Okay, so which is one way uh, to generalize uh, the uh, uh, Pankray's uh, last geometric theory. So the statement is the following. If I have an uh, error preserving diffeomorphism and given two invariant measures with a different action, then, so I don't need uh, either it's annulus or disk, it doesn't matter, okay? I don't need uh, anything uh, else and uh, just pick any two event measures. The event measures can be periodic points. If you find periodic points, you can compute its action. Or if you are lazy that you don't have C at periodic points, you can just take the whole area as the event measure. So you find the Calabi invariance or the mean action, okay? So as long as you give me two event measures, which includes all oh, type of periodic points, right? And then if there's any difference between these two actions, then I have infinite many uh, periodic points. In particular, I do have an estimate on the period of the new periodic points. So you always have more periodic points have with large period. 
And so the important part is what is the, the lowest period you can get. And so this is the estimate you can get. That is, for example, if this is larger than one, if the, the difference is larger than one, then there are at least two uh, geometrically distinct fixed points. Okay. And uh, uh, so this uh, uh, is a uh, way, one way uh, to generalize. And uh, it's, it's in, in fact, it's a very general and you can look at uh, the, the different statement in, on analysts, on disks or on two sphere. Okay. So all you need is look at uh, event measures and uh, compute their action. And if the action is uh, different, you have your other points. And uh, in particular, let, let me just give you an example. Suppose, I have uh, annulus. I have annulus with pure rotation, pure rigid, pure irrational rotation. Okay, and uh, in this case, every point has exactly the same action. So suppose, particularly the boundary has the same action in in a, in a sense. Suppose, I pick a, a point in the center. If I just make a small perturbation, rotate around the center, okay? So pick any point. I make a small perturbation, rotate that point, okay? And then I have created the infinite many periodic points, and this is not known before, right? So pick a point, rotate that point by a tiny bit. By rotation, I get a perturbation in action. The action can be added. So this rotation, uh, rotation adds some action. Well, it adds the action, adds the mini action. Now the mini action is different from the other action we had, particularly on the boundary. Then I have infinite many periodic points. So this easy way actually to create infinite many periodic points. So as a consequence or a corollary of this uh, result. Okay, so. Again, if you have the annulus, okay, there's no periodic points, okay, I can just pick a point, do a tiny rotation locally, and that change the action, the mini action, I've created an infinite many periodic points, okay. So, uh, so that's uh, one uh, remark, okay, and of course, depend on the size of this perturbation. The larger the perturbation I get, the smaller the period. I can get okay, so uh, uh, so that uh, kind of an interesting uh, consequence, and uh, 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 now okay, the um, let me see, uh, if okay, so if previously that uh, when when you try to to create periodic points, and uh, there's not uh, uh, many kind of a way. People working on closing them knows that how how hard it is to try to create points. Okay, and we we can use some global quantities, okay, to uh, to get to this and to create periodic points. Okay, so I don't have time to talk about the, uh, this uh, related to to uh, to closing them up, and that's a very very uh, interesting topic also. All right, so now this is one uh, uh, generalization, and bef uh, before I want to talk about the general idea in proving these things, and the proof is not. Hard, okay, by the way, okay, proofs are actually quite, quite straightforward and quite easy, okay. And uh, uh, I want to talk about another uh, generalization or uh, uh, how to generate this uh, in another direction, okay. So that I'm going to talk about the second uh, theorem. The second theorem is similar in nature, and the statement is very much similar. But uh, the internal dynamics or the, the structure we use is a little bit different. Okay, so let me, uh, I'm going to define something called a spin number. Okay, this spin number, it's quite actually uh, lateral. 
so let me try to explain. Th this is a kind of a relate to to talk uh, uh, that often given uh, uh, have given uh, a few uh, weeks ago. That uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Connie index, actually. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, motivate uh, what uh, a spin number is. Okay, so suppose I have a sympathetic human. And in this case, we will do be isotopic identity that's coming from Hamiltonian system, for example. Okay, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Okay, so I take event measure, any event measure. Okay, it can be periodic points, but that will be too easy. Okay, and typically a uh, non periodic uh, measure. And then for almost every point with respect to uh, mu, I can compute the upper of exponent, right? So the upper of exponent, as we all know, that uh, is a number. You take uh, the uh, derivative of the nth iteration and you look at the, uh, a tangent vector. You look at the, how the tangent vector grow. Okay, the act on the tangent vector grow under the map, and then take the average uh, of the log, that means takes average of the exponent. So that's why it's called the Lyapunov exponent. Here you take the log, okay? So basically that uh, for a uh, invariant measure and uh, uh, oscillated theorem, or oscillated theorem, which comes from basically a Bokov theorem, uh, that uh, you have, okay, uh, the up of exponent, probably all, we all know about the upper exponent. It measures the contraction and expansion of the tangent vectors, okay? However, so I want to uh, observe, make a remark, they do not capture how tangent vectors rotate in this space. So this, the, the upper exponent have a vector and probably it getting bigger and bigger expansion. And so that how fast expands, that's the upper exponent. So a simple question is, what about the vectors? One, eight, second, it eight, four, two. They rotate in this space. Why don't we do something to capture the rotation of the tangent vectors? Okay, well, that seems to be a lateral idea, but uh, uh, but in uh, and in two dimensional space, just simple rotation. In high dimensional space, in static space, well, it's two n dimensional, and it, or even not synthetic in three dimensional space, uh, the vectors rotate in you know, SO two. So can you capture this information? But of course, it turns out these simple naive ideas may or may not work. In general, dynamical system, uh, the rotational component are not typically well defined, or even if it is defined, and not very meaningful quality for, for dynamics. However, in terms of symplectic or Hamiltonian mechanics, and these things become interesting and important. Okay, so that's what uh, here I, I try to, uh, to, uh, to state. Okay, so special properties of a symplectic matrices. The symplectic matrices, this is a, a group, okay, a, a, a large group. And in the large group, the fundamental group is Z. That is, it doesn't matter what N is. In two dimension, the fundamental group of this is uh, Z. And in high dimension, any dimension, it's still Z. It's not like four dimension, I have two copies of Z. Z squared. Or in six dimension, I get three copies of Z, but that's not the case. Okay, for sympathetic matrices, and uh, if you go into high dimensions, the the fundamental group is still just M, uh, just Z for any N. Okay, so the rotational component, if you think in this particular space, okay, if you in a general linear group, that that's low structure. And that's why the, the, you don't get any meaningful quality, quantity. But in symplectic matrices, because of this property and the rotational component makes sense and it's meaningful and in, term, in fact, it's useful. 
So the way uh, a few weeks ago when uh, Dan Offen, uh talked about uh, these things, and he, he the way he talked about is uh, since this uh, in the space it's the, you have a Lagrangian subspace move in the whole large tangent space, and that uh, creates some kind of a spinning. Okay, so basically uh, you can understand these things in that way. Okay, uh, think in terms of Lagrangian subspace and move in the uh, in this uh, well in general space. And uh, that spins in the in the space, okay. And uh, uh, so, but we, we're going to present in a, in a little bit different way to, for easier to understand. You don't need to uh, to understand anything about the Lagrangian subspace, okay. But here, there's an issue here, okay. You actually uh, depend on the geometry, or, or if you don't have a Riemannian geometry embedded for this space, it depends on the affine connections. It's non-trivially depend on these uh, connections, okay? For, uh, for symplectic, uh, for the upper exponent, the geometry, even though we use geometry just for the size, it doesn't matter. You choose different geometry, you get the same number because it's limit. The different geometry gives you a small, error and that term basically goes to zero as I go to infinity. But here it's non-trivially depend on the uh, geometry. I can give a lot of examples, interesting examples uh, in, 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 uh, uh, that you get uh, different uh, results. But uh, again, anytime you have dependence uh, on geometry, on topology, and you get interesting things coming out of it, it's, it's a blessing instead of a, a difficulty. All right. Okay. So now I want to talk about uh, the spin number. Okay. Instead of talking about uh, the uh, Lagrangian subspace, uh, kind of in the in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, symplectic space, that how it moves, I, I'm we, I'm going to use uh, some simple things that one can understand. Okay. So if I take a symplectic matrix, the eigenvalues. I'm looking at the eigenvalue. The eigenvalues. Uh, they appear because it's synthetic in quadruples. If you have lambda is your eigenvalue, then lambda inverse your reciprocal is your eigenvalue, and then lambda complex conjugate and the complex conjugate is uh, reciprocal. These are all your eigenvalues. If these are real, okay, you get pair. If they are complex away from unit circle, you get four of them appear together. Okay, but let's just rearrange the eigenvalues into M, uh, uh, two uh, different ones. The first M is, uh, well, just choose the independent ones. And then the second uh, uh, group, just uh, their reciprocals. So the first group may be that, uh, uh, may, may be uh, lambda one equal, uh, well, uh, the complex conjugate, okay? All right, so, but we arrange them in such a way, the first M is something called the first kind. The first kind are two types. One type is the inside unit circle because once you have one inside unit circle, you have another one outside the unit circle. And if it's only a unit circle, we design them, uh, we make them to be something called a crane positive. Okay, if you don't understand what crane positive means, that doesn't matter. Okay, so just there's a way to arrange these eigenvalues and in two groups, first group and second group. Okay, and we define a map which takes the sympathy matrix to S1 by just this thing. Okay, this thing is the first group, the product of the first group. Okay. And this actually induces a uh, isomorphism uh, of the fundamental group. So this is uh, the space of symplectic matrices, and this is S1. They map this and, uh, uh, well, induces a map on the fundamental group and actually induces an isomorphism on the fundamental group. So instead of thinking in terms of a Lagrangian subspaces uh, spinning in the, in the bigger space, you can think that as how the eigenvalue change, okay? And that's a simple and straightforward way 
of uh, understanding uh, this. Okay, all right. So once we have a uh, map uh, isomorphism, and uh, uh, we can define uh, the uh, spin number. Okay. Uh, well, I should have I should say spin function because rotation is a, a different concept. Okay. So you can call it rotation spin, whatever. Okay, so any point we define the spin number to be this. So it's you iterate the, the map, okay? You iterate the map, and that gives you a matrix. And as the matrix gets bigger and bigger, this uh, kind of row, that's how it rotates in the space, okay? And then we take the average. Okay, here uh, we have to use, again, a bulk of a Gothic theory. The Birkhoff ergodic theory, the situation where you can apply Birkhoff ergodic theorem, the key is your function. You try to average some function. Birkhoff ergodic theorem says space average equal to time average. Okay, that's the essence of a Birkhoff ergodic theorem. But there's a condition. When you try to average something, it has to be either additive or subadditive. That's a key if you ever come to proof of, a, uh, if you teach a course in ergodic theory and uh, you come to the proof of a book of ergodic theory, the key is that you try to add has to be either additive or sub-additive. The upper exponent, why it works? Because it's sub-additive. Here, in this case, it's additive actually. But it's not exact additive because uh, the uh, it, there are some tiny arrow, so it's close to additive, and that doesn't uh, in terms of the average when you average it out, it doesn't really matter. That is tiny, tiny a difference that goes to a zero. So this thing is uh, has additive property, and when it has additive property or subadditive property, and then this limit exists by book of ergodic theorem exists almost every point, okay? So this number for symplectic diffeomorphism, but there's one catch. So when I say this, the one catch is the following, that this number, this is a matrix. It's, it's a, uh, this is a linear operator. It's not a matrix. When you have a matrix, uh, a linear operator, the problem is at different bases, okay? So when you, this is operator going from X to, it goes from X, the tangent space to Fi X. They have a two different tangent spaces, okay? It's, so therefore, the matrix depend on the bases you choose. Okay, so this is a linear operator, not a uh, a map, a self map. So therefore, this is not where defined. Okay, so even though I wrote something like this, but this number is not where defined. Okay, you need to where make this where defined. You need some geometry or some parallel transport to take this space, this space back to this space. If you have choose any uh, fi map of the tangent spaces, or choose any geometry, you have a Levi Civita uh, uh, connection, and then this will make sense. So therefore, it depends on the the uh, uh, the trivialization of your tangent space. Okay. So okay. So that's just a remark. So that's why I want to state the theorem for the uh, the disks. So because uh, this case we have a simple trivialization, but uh, so therefore, take this on the disk so you don't have to do anything. So matrix is take the whatever the matrix you get. All right. So by book of ergodic theorem, you get this number. Okay. For any value measure, you get the spin number, the average spin. Okay. And uh, so uh, now we can state the second result of ours. 
uh, the second result of ours is the following that uh, uh, if again why I'm going to do this d to d uh, you can do annulus and but in that case annulus does not have a uh, kind of intrinsic uh, geometry so therefore you need to choose a uh, trivialization but so easier just that the, in this context in this talk I just say take disk okay replace with annulus is fine but uh, then we need to do a little bit something so take disk this I get every preserved homomorphism, and I have two pick any two invariant measures and again if it's a periodic point you just average its spin okay in the context of periodic points let me just say the following if mu is periodic point and then the spin number s mu okay is connected to uh, the Connie Zander index okay if you know uh, what Connie Zander index is okay so it's connected in symplectic geometry that uh, to uh, uh, Connie Zander index again as I said the symplectic geometers they are only interested in, in geometry in uh, the kind of discrete cases but uh, I, here I want to do it with dynamics that is I'm looking at not just uh, a, a fixed point it's Connie Zander index I'm looking at the invariant measures I want to define uh, the kind of extension of the Connie Zander index for uh, the uh, invariant measures and when then we have this uh, theory the theorem says that if I have two point invariant measure uh, good choices are periodic points and invariant measures uh, they mean the uh, area form for example because that can be easily to if this is the area that's really easy to obtain just the, it's an integral okay a simple integral all right so we have the same theory that uh, if I see any differences in these and I get periodic points and if I see large difference if the difference is larger than one I see more than just a lot of periodic points I see fixed points that is if I have this and actually this will cover uh, the Pankre's lost geometric theory because now we're talking about uh, a spin number it's actually related to uh, the the twist condition on the uh, the boundary okay so these are uh, the two ways that uh, it, it, these are two basic two type of asymptotic invariants one is action one is the spin okay and these are uh, two ways we can generalize the uh, the Pankre's loss geometric theory Kind of in a in a almost identical uh, form. Okay, so uh, these are the uh, statements. Now I want to uh, uh, to talk about that. just some simple ideas that uh, the proof uh, the proof is not uh, uh, technical. It's not co complicated. It's just uh, some conceptual thing that one has to understand. The uh, the conceptually try to understand the uh, the these quantities uh, its connections with uh, dynamics okay the key the idea the proof we follow basically uh, the um, uh, the uh, John uh, Frank's uh, approach to uh, to prove of periodic existence of periodic points so the most general uh, theory in uh, Pankre's last geometric theory is uh, John Frank's um, proof. Uh, Pankre's proof uh, uh, certainly that's uh, ingenious uh, proof, very uh, the simple and uh, remarkable, uh, 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 but very ingenious uh, proof. But John Frank's proof is much uh, general and it uses something called uh, Brouwer's uh, plane translation theory. The Brouwer's plane translation theory. The Brouwer's plane translation theorem says if I, a homeomorphism has no fixed point, then it behaves like a plane translation. A plane translation just means that uh, uh, if I don't have uh, in R2, so 
So in R2, if a no fixed point, then how it behaves? It behaves like R2 embedded in this, the map just basically goes like this. So or xy goes to uh, x plus uh, 1y. So the map, basically, if you don't have a fixed point, it all looks like this with different coordinates. X just moves forward and keep Y the same. So basically, a line moves uh, forward. So this just means, this is uh, the Bauer's classical theorem and as old as Pancrase lost geometric theorem uh, is just, if you don't have a fixed point, it has to be something like this. Well, it also means if it has a periodic point of any period, then this cannot be true, right? If you have a periodic point of any period, it cannot return. Or you have any kind of a recurrence, that means you have to have a fixed point. Okay, so that's the basis of uh, John Frank's proof of uh, the Pancrase last geometric theorem. Okay, so the whole point, what we are trying to do, how do we create periodic points? I, we try to create proof existence of periodic points. How do we prove existence of periodic points? Well, the difficult part in closing lemma is try make a perturbation and not touching the uh, the your trajectories and make also the perturbation small. But with uh, Brouwer's fixed point, when you perturb to create a periodic points, probably a very large period. And but when you do this, create periodic points of very large period, and then the perturbation typically does not touch or create any fixed point. That means the following. That means the original map has to have a fixed point. That is, if I can do perturbation, create, say, I do a perturbation, create this maps here, these maps here, these maps here. So somehow I can do a perturbation to create a periodic point. Then it does not touch anything fixed. So therefore it has to have a fixed point somewhere in the beginning. So that, that's the whole concept in uh, the John Frank's approach to prove uh, the, uh, the fixed point. Uh, but uh, Pancrase last geometric theory. So in this context, uh, so let me just uh, 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 say this is my last trend, uh, slide. Okay, the key idea in the proof is we can approximate, okay, any event measured by periodic points by small perturbation. By small perturbation, when you do perturbation, you will try to prove the existence of periodic point, okay? You do perturbation, but you perturb the map in such a way the periodic points you can prove the existence is not created by your perturbation. That's the whole the, the key. Okay, so the periodic points, you existence periodic points, you prove the existence, but it's not because you did the perturbation. It's already there. The perturbation you did can be controlled in such a way it doesn't touch any periodic points of a lower period, basically. You create periodic points of large period, and that does not okay, touch anything possibly with lower period or fixed point, for example. example. The fixed point, if you want to touch a fixed point, it has to, to be, your point has to be near fixed point. So if your perturbation is a far away fixed point, and then you are safe. Okay, so that's a key idea. And the key idea is in better measures, you can approximate by a uh, periodic point. And when doing that, you are approximating by a tiny perturbation in the neighborhood you know you have control, okay? And that's the first key. The second key argument is that the action difference between two measures or two fixed points, it happened to be the flux, or you can, in certain ways, it's a mean rotation number. Okay, and uh, so if you want to move it to a, a familiar space, and that correspond to, uh, it blew up a fixed point, and then you look at the uh, animus. 
okay? Or you can directly do it, okay? So in terms of more abstractly, look at the flux of uh, uh, between any two lines in your, for your map. And between any two lines, the flux itself, it's uh, a measurement of the uh, rotation number. So that's the action part. The, uh, the other part about uh, the, uh, the rotation, uh, the uh, spin number, okay? In a sense, it's, it's easier than the action itself. And that, that part, the second theory, is uh, uh, it's more kind of evolved in uh, the, uh, the spin number. And, uh, but the first theory is basically you got the mean action, and the mean action corresponds to the uh, mean rotation number. Once you have mean rotation number, and uh, then you get, if you have a difference, you get uh, some information about the rotation number. If you just add another property, if you have a fixed point, that means the mean rotation number and your fixed point in, in between. There are lots of uh, uh, points with all the rotation numbers basically uh, in between. So that I, I'm not going to get uh, uh, into these details. And uh, uh, well, this is just exactly uh, one hour. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna uh, stop here. Okay, thank you very much. And again, happy birthday to hit the bell. Okay. Thank you, Jeff, for the excellent talk. And now we open to questions or comments uh, to the audience. Any question? Jeff, I have a, I have a question. Um, okay. It, um, when you uh, introduced that that uh, that asymptotic um, Maslow index, or what the the mean uh, the mean number corresponding to the spin there, uh, at yeah. the bottom of the yeah. page you mentioned something about if the if the invariant measure is ergodic. Um, right. Oh, so here we go. So if it's ergodic, mm -hmm. then this is a constant. So for so so you this theorem can't be used for for uh, ergodic measures, I guess. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. It's okay. any measure if it's ergodic. So because uh, the here, this is additive. Yeah. Uh, the, the row is additive. So therefore, right. the book of ergodic theory that uh, just perfectly applies. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so uh, if, okay, so, so if uh, periodic points, they are ergodic, and uh, you get a simple uh, uh, spin number, which corresponds yeah. to, of course, if it's a fixed point, correspond to a uh, uh, mass of index or in simplex category, yeah. that it's called mm -hmm. a Cartesian index. But, but yeah. Cartesian index is half of that, basically. Yeah, right, okay. okay. So it's, but, it's the same. The way defined is the same way as you did for uh, for the, uh, the Lagrangian subspace, but then yeah. I don't have a particular number. So in this way, I, I want to yeah. get a number. So this definition yeah. is more uh, straightforward and it's yeah. uh, computable. Yes. Okay. Very nice. It looks it looks very pretty. Very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Jeff. Uh, yeah. The eigenvalues you t you take outside the circle. Yeah. Right? Does mm -hmm. it make sense the uh, the function rho of a for uh, eigenvalues on the circle? Uh, the eigenvalues on the circle. So every time. The good question. So if you have an eigenvalue on this circle, this is a one, okay? And mm -hmm. this is one eigenvalue. And then because the complex conjugate, you have another one. So this is lambda, and that's lambda complex conjugate. So there are two of them on unit circle. That one mm -hmm. is called crane positive. They are otherwise crane negative. 
Okay, so mm -hmm. how do you decide? Oh, this is interesting by itself. Which one is claim positive? Well, if you have think this way, if you have two claim positive ones, lambda one is lambda two, that's lambda one and lambda two. If you have two claim positive ones collide, they they have to cross each other. They mm -hmm. don't split inside. So this, this is a simple uh, kind of a point, uh, the, the dynamic point of view. So if you have two claim positive cross each other, they can never split. They have to cross. Uh, but if you have one positive, one negative, and then the four eigenvalues, when they uh, collide, they can become these four. So here's a circle, and uh, two gets this away from the unit circle. Okay, so this is an interesting that, uh, phenomenon. That is, when your eigenvalues collide on the unit circle, that uh, why they don't just split outside of the unit circle. Well, it depends on the signature. The signature is called a crane signature. And uh, so one crane positive, one crane negative. And uh, the, the, when they collide, one, it's, it's like when, when people look at the stability of the equilibrium solutions of a Hamiltonian system, if it's all on unit circle, it's all simple, then it's medially stable. But when you have double eigenvalues, when you have double eigenvalue, the question is, are they still simple, uh, stable, or are they stable even after perturbation? This is a classical problem in Hamiltonian mechanics, stability of equilibrium solution or stability of fixed point. And when you have double eigenvalue, things get complicated. In this case, you need to look at the signature of these eigenvalues, okay? If the signature, okay, if that both crank, uh, crank positive, when they collide, it's safe. You still have stability in the neighborhood. You still have linear stability, no matter how you perturb them. It's a classical, interesting phenomenon in Hamiltonian mechanics, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Comments? Uh, there, there is a question at the chat, Idelberto. Huh? There is a question in the chat from from Jair. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. I saw you see yeah. that in the chat. Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, so when I talk about event measures, it's always probability measure. So that means. Uh, all invalid measure I'm talking about a uh, probability measure. That is the total volume of the measure is equal to one. Okay, that's that's a question. Okay, I I I, I, I never talk about unbounded measures. Okay. Um... I think we can uh, thank the speaker again. Yeah. Annette, it's up to you. Yeah, we're hey. going to we're going to do a uh, a presentation from. Uh, from uh, Idelberto Vinhetas, because we have uh, so many new people today. <laughs> so, it's coming, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs>
Okay, <laughs> so we can we can stop to recording, and if you want to open your cameras to take a picture from today, 